I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. You know, just a couple of years ago, the military identified veteran suicide as its highest clinical priority. Although declining, suicide remains the leading cause of death among veterans. We're joining me in a conversation of the scope and factors of veteran suicide, as well as prevention measures, is Michael Gartland, the Suicide Prevention Coordinator at the Salem Veterans Administration Medical Center. And thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely, sir. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you know, from let's get a sense from the national kind of perspective. What kind of numbers are we talking about? How many veterans are we losing to suicide a year, approximately? It's hard to say. Uh, the most recent numbers I've seen are about 14 veterans a day, and that's, that's an incredible number. Um, and when I'm talking to people, having conversations like this, uh, I like to talk a little bit about who the veterans are that are dying by suicide. And when I have that conversation, um, the younger veterans are dying by suicide at a much higher rate. And what I mean by that is the percentage of them. And these are the veterans that I think most people think of. Veterans that have been deployed, have seen combat, are struggling with things like PTSD, depression, substance use, um, and there's a lot of impulsivity associated with death by suicide, hopelessness, feeling like they don't have a whole lot of options. What well, people are really surprised to learn, the actual larger number of veterans who die by suicide are 55 and up. And we start having this conversation, it's, it takes on a little bit different scope because you're talking about um, men, typically Caucasian, 20th century guys who are um, starting to experience a lot of medical issues and quality of life issues. And in our area, like Southwest Virginia and rural areas, um, independence is huge. You have a gentleman that lives in a, in a single wild trailer out in a you know, rural community, um, and he comes into the hospital and with some declining health issues, and it, it doesn't even have to be necessarily a terminal issue, but say, um, hey, you know, sir, your, your vision's going, we're gonna have to talk to you about taking your driver's license, things of that nature and independence becomes an issue and things like that. So um, there's a lot, like as you said earlier, there's a lot of complexity to it. It's not like a monolithic one size fits all um, problem, nor is it a one size fits all solution. And I did see in the report, which was interesting, is that um, there was less of a decline among women veterans. Yeah related to the suicide. Absolutely, and that's probably sort of a, a silent population of folks um, just talking by way of numbers, um, overall women, females represent about 10 to 11 percent of the overall veteran population. And that seems to be pretty accurate in our area in southwest Virginia as well. And oftentimes people don't even think of, um, you know, females that have served and things like that. And they're facing, in addition to all the complexities that your typical veteran is facing, they also have some additional things, um, diff additional challenges, you might say. And what I mean by that is, is that um, they already have an uphill battle oftentimes to establish credibility and respect in a, in a male dominant area like, like the military. Um, and while we've reduced the stigma surrounding uh, mental health and substance use and treatment and things like that, the minute someone speaks up and says, hey, I need some help, people are, hey, that's great for you. But now if they want to re-enlist, if they're looking at promotions, if things, you know, other things are going on in their life, there's, there's still that sort of burden, like I'm the one, I'm the weak one. And unfortunately, um, and, I, and I would say this about the veteran population in general, um, the men and women that need the help the most are often the last ones to ask for it. Because again, because of being tough, being independent, being strong, being able to pull yourself by the, per, up by the uh, proverbial bootstraps kind of disposition. Well, you know, one of the things that surprised me too when I read the report, and to me it was totally counterintuitive, is that rural veterans, 20% more than in the urban areas. I would have thought, and I don't know why, but my mm -hmm. assumption was that I would have thought that the urban areas would have had higher rates than necessarily the rural areas. Right. I, and part of that, because um, there's all sorts of different factors, but part of it goes back to what I said earlier, is that a lot of... Um, if, if you live in a smaller community with fewer resources and transportation is an issue and things of that nature, that can be one of the variables. But then also, like I said, you have a lot of, um, as I said earlier, um, blue collar 20th century. And I say this as if it's a population over there. I'm talking about myself. I'm like one tick away from it. But again, um, you know, men, men that grew up, Caucasian men that grew up with Chuck Norris, with John Wayne, with like that is what it is to be a man. And, and we serve with that sort of identity and that's, that's who we are and we're providers and we're protectors. The moment that that becomes, um, that identity is jeopardized. Um, and it's not nearly as impulsive as like I was saying earlier with some of the younger veterans. It's, a, it's an eyes wide open quality of life. I'm not gonna be in a nursing home. 
I'm not going to wear a diaper. I'm not going to have a feeding tube and, and these quality of life issues. Um, and when I have these conversations, again, in like in a public forum, oftentimes a lot of the, the survivors, the, the family members that um, have, ha have lost someone to suicide, they start to, they start to validate that and say, yeah, that's right, because dad said that he just didn't want all his money to go, you know, to, to be taken away, that he built this, this, uh, this life savings and he didn't want it to be just um, taken from him, that he wanted to make sure his kids and his wife and the people um, still had something left, so. And um, well, let's take a look at Virginia. Uh, Virginia actually averages kind of nationally is kind of better than many other states. How does Virginia uh, filter in this? Virginia, from and I, when I'm talking about Virginia, I'm talking about our catchment area, which is out of the Salem VA healthcare system. We take, um, say, from roughly like Lynchburg in that area down into southwest Virginia, um, and then down towards Danville and into a, little, so a few areas in North Carolina. We, the numbers that you see nationally um, match up with what we experience in our catchment area as far as um, both veteran population and death by suicide. And, and when I, like what I was saying earlier, the, the higher number in the older population, we have an aging population of veterans. Um, another issue that comes up um, is access to uh, firearms and things like that in our area. Firearms um, are are used in hunting and home protection. They're, they're part of many people's culture and things like that. Um, and one of the biggest indicators or one of the biggest things we do on the prevention side of things is kind of putting time and distance between means like that um, to help, especially with the younger veterans, to avoid impulsive death by suicide. And so we do, we spend a lot of time um, talking about gun safety and gun locks. Um, was working with Roanoke Cities. Um, they've got gun locks and all the city libraries and we're, we've partnered with them to do some advertising and things like that. So in addition to addressing the suicide issue, just looking at gun safety in general, um, because it's a big factor in our area. And I'm assuming that perhaps one of the number one associations or correlations is um, post-traumatic stress disorders. Yes, yes. And that is treatable, right? I mean, in other words, yes. it, it is one of the f factors, but it's, it's treatable. It's treatable, it's treatable. It goes. And, it, and unfortunately, it goes back to something I said earlier. I think um, the men and women that struggle the most are oftentimes the last ones to ask for help. Ask for help. And, and PTSD, if you've been deployed, and this I'm, I'm thinking of veterans that I've worked with who've been deployed, and they, they tend to normalize it. They don't see it as hypervigilance or that they're struggling. It's like, that's how it was trained. Um, and when you actually start talking to them and, and you're like, well, I have to take multiple routes to work. I don't take the same same path to work, or if there's something on the roadside, you know, some, some clutter or some debris or whatnot, I've got to stop, make a U-turn, go in a different direction. I'm always doing a head count wherever I'm at. It's very normal based on their experience. And actually getting to a place, oftentimes um, somebody comes to treatment, it's usually um, they're compelled to by somebody close to them that's like, man, and there's something different about you. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, I got my start when I started working at the VA in our PTSD treatment program. Um, and it is something that's definitely treatable. We have, um, at our facility here in Salem, we have outpatient, we have a residential PTSD program that's highly effective and, and well thought of. And yeah, so I mentioned that because I, I, I strongly encourage folks that are struggling to, to reach out and get help. And we'll talk about some of, of those things as well in a moment. But I sure. also thought it was interesting when the correlation between like pain and disabilities. Absolutely. Uh, that starts taking a particular toll. and. I guess, and you mentioned about the younger people, mm -hmm. we blame everything on social media, but I guess there is perhaps a correlation there too as it relates to mental health. I mean, I'm assuming that's Absolutely. a byproduct as well. Mental health um, is, a, is a big factor. Um, also substance use and substance use and mental health, that dual diagnosis area and trying to, um, it's, it's a term that's thrown around a lot, is but self-medicating and trying to take care of it and it actually makes it worse. Um, things of that nature. Also, like say, for example, alcohol, which is very common amongst veterans as, as, as a go-to. Um, it's legal, it's something you can use. It, it lowers inhibition, it, it, it amplifies depression and things of that nature. And so people oftentimes, unfortunately, will make very impulsive, emotionally charged, short-term decisions that have like um, consequences that are irreversible. And so that's what we're trying to prevent. Um, so in terms of some prevention tactics, I guess, Clinical intervention, that, that is probably the, the strongest or perhaps most successful when that can be done on a consistent basis? Yes, sir. I, ideally, that is the situation. One of the things I like to talk about um, 
in conjunction with evidence-based clinical practice, substance use, mental health, maybe something's focused at PTSD um, specific, is really talking to um, the friends, the family, the, the people around um, veterans, and just people in general um, who can also intervene. And one of the programs that the VA has is the SAVE program. And it's just a simple sort of roadmap to kind of help people um, meet the needs of people who are struggling and intervene. And the reason we do that, um, and something I'm super passionate about, is like I said, sometimes men and women who are struggling the most are the last ones to ask for help. They don't want to talk to a shrink. They don't want to talk to a professional. I don't know. Um, and what I've seen at the VA, I mentioned the residential treatment program, um, you may have somebody there that's, that's um, there for formal treatment um, and they're struggling. And the first person they connect with or talk to isn't the mental health professional, but it's the man or woman in housekeeping or in food service that just knows them. And so equipping those people like on the periphery and also people in the community, friends and family, to have these um, difficult um, conversations with people, oftentimes they can be even more effective, at least at opening the door to treatment and, and engaging people where they're at. You know, I'm assuming, because we see this nationwide as it relates to mental health and, and having some interventions, but it's access. Yeah. Do you supply and demand, can you meet the demand as it comes to some of the treatment and interventions? That is one of the top priorities at the VA um, nationally, but I know at the Salem VA in particular, is opening up that door and opening it up quicker and trying to get um, veterans access to care with, in less than 30 days or 28 days or less and really trying to get them um, the help they need as quick as possible because that's always been, um, I, I think, a big issue. and. It, we're not lost, it's not lost on us that when a person is actually ready, that we really want to capitalize on that. Because that's probably one of the biggest indicators of success is when somebody is volitionally ready or in that space where they, they're asking for help and seeking help. And so we want to be there for them. So to answer your question, um, it's an ongoing struggle and, and coming off of post-COVID, we are, we're struggling to kind of get the doors back open and it flowing. And, and that's one of the top priorities, like I said, both at the Salem VA, but also nationally to try to have providers ready to go um, getting veterans in the front door as soon as possible. One of the things we're doing too is opening up multiple doors so veterans are able to come in not only through um, traditional means but also just through primary care and other avenues to get there. So if they come in for their regular medical appointment and they're struggling in some way, we're trying to do assessments there and then also get them referred to where they need to go um, earlier than crisis, not, not waiting for someone to come through the ED or the, the standard way that people come, come to treatment but trying to engage them at all all sorts of levels of care. And I guess one thing we mentioned earlier, but the importance of family and friends. What are some things that you would look for? What are some signs of danger? What, how, do you, how would you inform them to things to be aware of? Sure. Because that seems to me the most beneficial intervention initially would be a family or friend. I am so glad you asked. And, and the reason I, I wanna, I'll, I'll mention two. If I had to pick one single variable that um, somebody that was at high acute risk and someone that was at risk that got help. It was having some degree of social support. That's probably the single biggest factor. Will somebody miss me? Do I have children? Is there somebody that cares? So you're absolutely right. And those voices speak um, volumes to someone who's struggling. To answer that, the question about what to look for, um, the short version of, the short answer to that is any kind of major change. If, if, if there's some sort of flip in someone's life, um, some of the typical signs and symptoms are um, irritability, anger, isolation is huge, increase in substance use. And these are all things, like I said, particularly if they're totally out of character for that individual. And what I mean by that, you used to have this outgoing guy that enjoyed fishing with his buddies and now he's just in the basement and he's, he just won't come out and he's isolated and he's cut off and people just don't know where he's at. Um, again, like increase now, um, you have someone that historically maybe was a social drinker, but now like every time you see them, they're, they're, they're struggling with alcohol, things of that nature. Again, any kind of major shift. Um, and as I said, I think one of the biggest protective factors is some sort of social connection, family, friends, church, community of any kind. Um, and on the other side of that, one of the biggest risk factors is isolation and being completely cut off. Um, and that's one of the things, going back to like the SAVE training and just in talking in general, um, not being afraid as a friend, as a family member, if you have that feeling just to start that conversation, because oftentimes just knowing that you see that in me 
is enough to change the trajectory slightly or enough to like open it up. Because when someone's under the weight um, of, of thinking about suicide, suicidal ideation, it be, you become so cut off that it is just you. And that's when the hopelessness and the depression and things become very, very overwhelming. Having one person just to ask, to care enough to ask, to make that eye contact, to kind of connect with a person, oftentimes, like I said, is enough to just shift that trajectory slightly. And what about the financing and cost? Is that, I mean, insurance, um, if you're a veteran, of course, you're supposed to be able to have access for right. care. Is that a major impediment in terms of expense and cost? It used to be, let me tell you, starting in January of 2023, Congress passed an act, the Compact Act, um, to open up doors for veterans. So uh, veterans who are not even enrolled, if someone has served and they're a veteran and they're experiencing a suicidal crisis right now, there is funding in place that includes the ambulance to the hospital, um, up to 30 days inpatient care and up to 90 days of outpatient care related to that suicidal um, crisis. And again, that, you don't have to be established at the VA. And this, this level of care can take place at Carilion, at Lewis Gale, wherever. So that's another thing, not only in the financing, but also access. You don't necessarily have to come to the VA. You can choose not to. Um, obviously, we, we would love to have you there. But again, maybe you have your, your health care already taken care of at your, with your local doctor and your local health care system. And we don't want that to be an impediment. We don't want cost, like you said, to be an impediment. So that's in play right now. They've gone through the different charts. If you have served, if, if you're a veteran, that Compact Act care is there available for you right now if you're struggling with a suicidal crisis. Um, so yeah, that should never be, that should never be um, a, a roadblock. I want to identify several uh, resources uh, and, and for you to kind of describe them. Mm -hmm. um, and one, of course, is the Veterans Crisis Line. Is that 24 hours or how is that? Actually? Absolutely, sir. So the 988, that's the abbreviated number that uh, was they started a couple years back, um, goes to the National Crisis Hotline and anyone can call that. They don't have to be a veteran. That's a national hotline. 988 is National Crisis Hotline. If a veteran calls that 988 number and presses option one, that directs them to a group of people that actually work for the Veterans Health Administration who are veteran crisis line callers. And to your point, um, they are open 24 seven. They're available via chat. They're available online. There's different ways to access them as this technology changes. They're trying to be available. Um, it can be completely confidential. They have access. They have limited access to um, people's charts and things of that nature so they can um, um, they have access to a little bit of information so they can better serve people. They can connect people with um, housing, medication, and a variety of resources. And the reason I mention that is because I encourage people, I encourage veterans in particular, um, to reach out early. You can call at a, at a level four or a level five concern. It doesn't have to be a level eight, level nine, like suicide crisis. So call early. If you're struggling with housing, if you're struggling with medication, if there's something going on, call that 988 um, number, option one, and get you know reach out earlier. Um, the vast majority, my team at the Salem VA Medical Center, we, we respond to the VCL consults that come in from that hotline. And the vast majority of them are not specific to suicide, um, but it, as I said, it, they're related to housing, medication, access to care. So again, that's very appropriate. Reach out if you're struggling. If someone you know is struggling, reach out now and get help early. Absolutely. And what about the Salem facility? Tell us a bit about what's available there, size, scope, and uh, as a resource. Absolutely. We have a, we have a fully operational emergency department. We have, a, and then leveling up from there, we have an acute um, mental health center, um, a locked unit uh, for mental health for both detox, um, as well as um, if people who are struggling with um, extreme mental health issues. We also have, as I said earlier, both outpatient and residential treatment. And the residential treatment side, we have a 30-day substance abuse program. We have a four, four to five week um, residential PTSD program. We have one um, building dedicated, it's called the Center for Traumatic Stress. It's dedicated to people who are struggling um, with uh, PTSD in particular, doing a lot of outpatient work there and doing comprehensive work with folks. So, I mean, there's a lot of resources right here. Um, and what I've heard from veterans who've come in, because we have veterans that come in from all over the country for these different resources, um, the care they get is so good that it's not uncommon for them to um, move their care here and actually come to our area because of the, they're able to get a, a higher level of care than in their, in their community. So it's something I'm proud of and we're proud of at the Salem VA Medical Center. You mentioned a little bit earlier 
but I found it very interesting, and that is the veterans training brochure, and it talks about SAVE, S-A-V-E. Yes. Can you give us a little overview of what sure. those stand for and how that's informative? And absolutely, informative. absolutely. SAVE, it, it, it's, it's the government, it's the VA, we're connected, we, we serve veterans, so we love acronyms. So that S-A-V-E um, simply stands for signs, asking the question, validate, and then expediting getting a person to care. And so going back to your earlier question, those initial signs when someone is struggling, when you're starting to observe changes, um, somebody's starting to isolate, somebody's starting to increase um, their substance use, being aware, just noticing those signs. And oftentimes, you know, people will have sort of a gut reaction. You're, you're just not yourself, Bob. I mean, there's something a little bit off. So noticing the signs, um, the A stands for asking the question. And what we tell people, um, Fear is one of the big things that I think prevents people from having this conversation. When I say fear, I mean it broadly. Is, is one, I, I'm a little reluctant to, to say something, but then there's also the fear of like, well, what if the answer is yes? Like, what am I going to do then? What we have found is that, um, as I said earlier, asking the, correct, the question directly, hey, Bob, are you thinking of killing yourself? I'm worried about you. I could be wrong here, but are you having thoughts like that? Um, one of two things happen. If the person is not having those thoughts, they usually like, man, no, get out of here. You're, yeah, no, no. And, 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 and there's no sort of offense taken. If the answer is yes, oftentimes the answer to that question is in the form of a silence and just a recognition and things like that. Um, and so it's a powerful question, and we encourage people just to ask it directly. And, and you can hear the difference if I start to say, you're not thinking of hurting yourself, are you? Um, if I'm backing away, if I'm reluctant to have it, somebody who's really struggling may not want to burden that other person because they can see that they don't want to, they don't want to yes. So again, I, I encourage people just to ask that question um, directly. S-A-V, that, that V stands for validate. And validate doesn't mean saccharine. That doesn't mean, oh, it's going to be okay, Bob. It's, oh, it's going to be fine. But just sitting there in that space, Bob, I can see you're struggling, man, and, and you're really going through it right now. And sometimes that's just enough, as I said earlier, like just being, just sitting there with that person, knowing them, they're being seen, they, they realize now it's kind of being reflected back to them, man, things are serious. And then last but not least is the E, um, and expediting getting them to care. And again, like I said, whether it's the veterans crisis line, getting them to an emergency room, again, Compact Act um, funding is in place for veterans, so, so money shouldn't be a, a problem. Calling 911, getting them in an ambulance, again, transportation is covered under that Compact Act. You know, getting them help as quickly as possible. Um, and so again, that's just a short acronym, that S-A-V-E. But it's one that's very powerful. And again, it's not just for clinicians, it's, it's primarily for uh, friends, family, um, and not just for veterans too, but um, certainly a part of the program we offer, so. We're down to a couple of minutes sure. or so. What greatest challenge um, you think in this arena? Uh, next steps, what would you like to say in the final couple of minutes or so? I think the biggest thing is um, the stigma that's associated with suicide, both on the front and on the back end. Um, one of the things as Salem uh, Suicide Prevention Coordinator, I, I have the opportunity to contact families after someone dies by suicide. And that is, a, it's both an honor and it's, a, and it's a very powerful type thing. Um, so I know that the families, after someone has died by suicide, they struggle, even, even them, they, they struggle to get help because nobody wants to talk about it. There's so much shame associated with it. There's so much um, angst. There's so many questions and things of that nature. And that's really, um, having that, had that experience has really increased my passion for, um, as I said earlier, like noticing those signs and symptoms and not putting my fear aside to genuinely connect with people if I'm concerned. And that's what I encourage friends and families to do. If you're concerned, ask the question, um, know that there's help out there, there's resources, um, and, and don't be afraid to, to, to connect and to ask that, that, that question um, that could potentially save a life. Well, this is a very uh, important uh, area and concern without question. The good news is that it appears it is an emphasis that's being highlighted within Absolutely. the veteran agencies. Seems to be more and more allocation in terms of resources. But again, if family and friends can be sensitive enough to recognize and try to get help, that's critical. Absolutely. Michael, thank you so much for joining me in the conversation. Absolutely. And as always, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.